Uh, welcome all and thank you for joining today's session. My name is Michael Downey and it's great to welcome you all to another AWRI webinar. Uh, today's session takes a look at managing reductive aromas in wine and we'll find out whether traditional removal techniques are effective, what the latest research tells us about the formation of these compounds and which remediation strategies are most effective. But before we share some insights into some of these questions, some very quick reminders for you, the audience. To provide a comment or to ask a question, please open the Q&A section of the AWRI uh, of the webinar toolbar. Type your question in and click to send it through. Uh, if you'd like to get involved through Twitter, please use the Twitter handle at the underscore AWRI. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available to view later this afternoon from the AWRI's YouTube channel. All registrants will receive a link to view this um, after the session. Now, for those of you that have just joined us, welcome. Today's AWRI webinar takes a look at reductive aromas in wine, and I'm thrilled to welcome our speaker. Joining us today from here at the AWRI is Dr. Marlies Becker. A senior research scientist, Marlies has been with the AWRI since 2011 and her primary research interests have been in the formation and fate of undesirable sulfur compounds in wine. So Marlies, it's fantastic to have you here and your expertise on hand for today. And I'll hand over to you to get us started. Um, thank you, Michael, for the kind introduction and good morning, everyone. So like Michael mentioned earlier, today I'm gonna to talk about managing and remediating reductive aromas in wine. So why should we care at all? Um, I really like to show the slide because this is a really good summary just of the faults and taints that um, we face in our wines. And as you can see here, um, this graph represents over 100,000 samples that were submitted to the International Wine Challenge, a big wine show in London over the past nine years. So all the results has been collated and they summarize all the faults and taints and um, group them according to their closure types. So here we can see the wines that were rejected for faults under cork, under screw cap, under synthetic closures, and then all closures put together. So the first thing that we can see here is that um, oxidation is one of our biggest bars and we can see that wines under cork have got more rates of oxidation, which is not surprising, and screw cap has got less rates of oxidation. Another quite obvious finding is that um, wines under cork also had more cork taint problems, which we, are also, we also expect that to happen. But something that's very interesting is that wines that were rated for their reductive faults or their sulfides had similar rates of rejection under both cork and screw cap. So we had a 0.8% re um, rejection rate for wines that were under cork as well as under screw cap. So this is really interesting because many people still think that screw cap closures are the cause of reductive aromas or that cork closures can fix reductive aromas. But this is quite powerful to say that this is not the case at all and that it's really how you set up your wine early during fermentation that will determine whether you get, whether you have a risk for developing reductive faults later on. So let's have a look at our main culprits. So there's a lot of compounds associated with reductive aromas, but the main ones that we usually see in wine are hydrogen sulfide, methane thiol, ethane thiol, dimethyl sulfide, um, our disulfides such as DMDS and the thioacetates. So here's a, um, a table that summarizes the common um, volatile sulfur compounds or VSCs, as well as their aroma descriptors. And you can see they're quite awful. So rotten eggs, sewage, putrefaction, burnt rubber, burnt match, cheesy, eggy, garlicky. They're pretty, not the things that you would like in your wine. And some important takeaway from this table as well is the low aroma thresholds. So some of the compounds that is most important for reductive aromas, H2S, methanthyl and ethanthyl, have very low aroma thresholds. So a very small amount of these compounds have a very large impact on the wine aroma. So this really, these thresholds are also just a guideline. So it's not set in stone because people's perception of uh, um, sulfur compounds are quite unique. So some people are very sensitive to it and a very small amount of these compounds 
can really have a large impact on, on their perception of the wine, whereas other people are completely, um, they don't smell it at all. But another important thing to take away is that um, how these aroma descriptors change as well as how the aroma thresholds change as the complexity of the molecules increases. So many of our remediation strategies can transform um, our sulfur compounds, for example, um, methane thiol to something larger like DMDS, dimethyl disulfide, and then you will go from a uh, rotten cabbage burnt rubber putrefaction aroma with a very low aroma threshold to something with a much higher aroma threshold and you've changed the aroma to more vegetal cabbage and onion like so i mean it's still not ideal but at least um cabbage and onion like is a lot better than the rotten cabbage or the putrefaction and something that's also interesting is that sometimes when you um, perceive these sulfur compounds in your wine you don't always initially see them as these ascriptors but rather just as a suppression of fruit so before we get started, um, I thought I'd start with this quote because I really like it for life as well as for science, because I think it's really important to understand where you come from and where these compounds come from to know how to best remediate them and to know um, where your wine is going. So I'll spend a little bit of time just recapping the um, the stages of fermentation where these compounds are produced and um, some of their um, formation pathways. And then we'll move over to more discussion of the re remediation strategies. And at the end of the talk, I'll leave you with a very elegant um, remediation decision tree. And this was published by Craig Mint et al. a while back, and that'll help guide you um, in which remediation strategies would be best to use. So let's start with H2S. Where does it come from? So I'm sure everybody is very familiar with their sulfur assimilation pathway, but um, we know that H2S is used by the yeast to build its sulfur-containing amino acids because the, use, the juice usually doesn't have enough of these sulfur-containing compounds for the yeast to use. So the yeast can use all sorts of sulfur sources, for example, sulfate or sulfite, and then um, move it into the yeast cell and then reduce it to sulfide. And this sulfide can be used to be incorporated into cysteine as well as methionine. So when the yeast doesn't have enough nitrogen sources to produce these amino acids, then it'll pump out the H2S. So that's why we know that it's so important to have enough nitrogen or a high yan in our, in our juice um, to help us mitigate the risk of uh, producing sulfide off odors. So if we look at the formation of our alkyl thiols, like methanthal, for example, that is um, formed through the methionine pathway. And we also know that met methanthal is an important precursor to other stinky sulfurs like the thioacetates. Um, and that's usually um, from the reaction with acetyl-CoA, which is an enzyme. Um, but methionine can also break down as well as a cysteine and then produce other compounds such as 2 mercaptoethanol and methionol. And recent studies has also shown that H2S can directly lead to the formation of ethanthyl as well as ethyl thioacetate and diethyl disulfide. So if we look at our disulfides, um, their formation is usually pretty simple. It's just simple oxidation reactions. So they are produced during oxidative handling of the wine and the ferment. Um, and it can also be formed through metal catalyzed reactions. And I'll show you a little bit of those metal catalyzed reactions a little bit later. And our dialkyl sulfides, like our dimethyl sulfide, that's also produced during fermentation, as well as aging from the wine. So we know that the S-methylmethionine is a main precursor to DMS. And this is also a very important compound in beer. And our thioacetates also produced during fermentation um, through uh, the reaction with um, acetyl-CoA, like I spoke about previously. And this is also a very dynamic um, formation pathway because they're produced um, during fermentation. But once you have them in your wine, they can slowly um, acid um, hydrolyze through the acidity in the wine and then again release their thiols. So then you go from something with a high aroma threshold to something with a low aroma threshold and something that might smell a little bit more cheesy um, or garlicky to again your putrefaction and your rotten um, sewage type aromas. <laughs> 
So we also have a lot of other factors that drive the formation of volatile sulfur compounds. And one that's quite interesting, um, and I thought worth mentioning at the moment, is glutathione additions. Because I don't know um, if you are aware about the regulations in uh, Europe, but there's a lot of discussions about potentially allowing glutathione addition to must. So glutathione is naturally occurring in juice. Um, and it is it can act as an antioxidant, so it can use can be used potentially as a SO2 alternative, just as antioxidant and not as antimicrobial, of course. Um, and it can be used to prevent um, the oxidations of mercaptans, and it can also act as a sacrificial nucleophile to prevent thiol scalping. But of course, glutathione has its own sulfur moiety. So that can um, also lead to the increases in H2S, ethanthal, methanthyl acetate, and ethyl thioacetate, like Rahut published a few years back. So she showed that with increasing, um, with a stepwise increase of glutathione, you see an increase, um, a stepwise increase in H2S production. So of course, this is very affected by yeast strain. Not all of the yeast strains have the ability to utilize glutathione and other nutrients. So it's very specific to yeast. Um, and here at the AWRI, we've also recently um, conducted a very big uh, winery scale uh, trial where we looked at glutathione additions um, to um, ferments pre and post inocul inoculation. Sorry. And what we saw initially was that you immediately see a large loss of glutathione. But then very interestingly, we initially didn't see any differences between our control wine or the wines with added glutathione. So they had exactly the same amount of hydrogen sulfide produced at the end of fermentation. And then again, three months post bottling, there was nearly no hydrogen sulfide. But then as the wines aged, you'll see that we, um, the H2S remained quite low in the wines without any added glutathione, whereas we saw this dramatic increase in H2S production from the glutathione treated wines. So why this is so interesting to me is um, the majority of people think glutathione just breaks down and releases H2S. But for me, this graph shows that it's maybe a bit more of a complicated um, pathway and not just a simple desulfurization of glutathione. Because for me, it looks like uh, glutathione is actually producing latent sources. And some of these latent sources we'll touch on a little bit later. Um, and specifically, the potential polysulfanes that the glutathione and the H2S can be involved in producing. So what do you do if you've got a reductive wine? So you've done the best that you could, but unfortunately, your wine um, ended up quite stinky. So we'll be discussing it in three different steps. So we'll be discussing low intervention or prevention methods. And then we'll discuss moderate intervention remediation techniques. So this is where it needs um, input from the winemaker, but not necessarily any specific additives. And then we'll discuss some high intervention techniques where you actually have to add some um, additives such as copper to clean up your wines. So our low intervention or prevention techniques. Um, so these are very effective against managing H2S, methanthyl, ethanthyl, and methylthioacetate. And these are um, all the things that you've learned um, in your studies um, in becoming winemakers. So your fermentation conditions is very important. Yeast strain is critical and available nutrients is super important as well. So we know that um, yeast strains um, react very differently in their ability to produce H2S. And usually um, the, their ability to form other sulfur compounds sort of matches that. So here um, in this graph, we can see the ability of nine different yeast strains to produce um, H2S. So you can see some of them produce no H2S. So that's the white bars, whereas others produce quite large amounts of H2S and some medium producers. And then the other thing that we also know is how important our nitri nitrogen sources are. But this is um, a lot more complicated than this um, simple table is showing us here, because um, in this study in the, uh, in the late 70s, they showed that by increasing your nitrogen concentrations, you can decrease the amount of H2S being produced in your wines. But now we know that um, Adapt addition isn't always doesn't always go exactly as planned, and in certain instances, DAP addition 
um, are associated with increased HDS production because it's really dependent on the yeast's ability to metabolize DAP and also at which point of the ferment you add your DAP and the ferment composition, of course. And then there's also other things that um, impact um, these formation of these sulfur compounds. So by limiting your external sulfur sources, you can also prevent the formation of some of these unwanted stinky sulfurs. So we know um, that um, elemental sulfur sprays is very, very risky. If you've got anything left on your grapes um, and you make wine from that, you will produce a lot of H2S. 262 micrograms per liter of H2S is enormous. But what's interesting is that you get a lot of other fungicide sprays that can also um, result in the formation of H2S. And some of them don't even contain any sulfur sources like these ones over here. And that is usually linked to all the other additives or other um, compounds that make up these fungicide sprays. So there can be a lot of catalytic metals in there that can catalyze the formation of H2S from other precursor sources. And um, just following up on this elemental, the role of elemental sulfur residues, oh, sorry, that's too quick, um, in the vineyard, a recent study by Gavin Sachs's group from Cornell has also looked into these um, elemental sulfur residues in the vineyard. And what was very interesting from their study was that they found that, um, so they added quite a lot of elemental sulfur, but nothing that apparently is unreasonable for what could happen if you spray sulfur too late and it ends up on the grapes. And initially at bottling, they found that they um, didn't produce any free H2S. So even with that enormous 100 milligram per liter of residual sulfur, no H2S was perceived. But then three months later after bottling, H2S started to occur. So again, this points to that um, latent sources or precursors of H2S that's produced. And they actually went hunting for these latent sources and they did find one and they did find a, a polysulfane that consists of two glutathione molecules bound to one H2S. So um, these latent sources appear to be very important in determining your risk for developing reductive aromas later on. So once you've um, done all the preventative steps, um, it still sometimes happen that your wines still go reductive. And then we move over to more um, moderate intervention steps. So these are our aerative racking, pump over, splashing, and macro oxygenation techniques. So they work very simply, um, just simple methods of oxidation. So hydrogen sulfide gets oxidized to form colloidal sulfur. But this is very important that this has to be removed. You have to rack this off or filter it out because otherwise H2S will just be um, returned once um, reductive conditions has been established in the wine. And similarly, you can remove your ethane thiol through oxidation to produce your disulfides. And this is not necessarily symmetrical disulfides. So you can also form unsymmetrical disulfides where you might have your ethane thiol group on the one side but then you can have your glu a glutathione or a cysteine on the other side. Um, and this can be quite stable. And then you can also remove your um, stinky sulfurs so through um, their reaction with oxidation reaction products. So when you have polyphenols in your wine, they can produce quinones through enzymatic reactions with PPO or um, metal. So that is polyphenol oxidase. And then this quinone will react with your thiols to form this um, polyphenol sulfur complex. And this is quite stable and can be seen as a sulfur trap that will remove the sulfurs from your wine and with a very, very low risk of um, reintroducing those stinky sulfurs. So macro oxygenation is a technique that introduces a lot of uh, high doses of oxygen into wines. And typically you introduce, you dose two to 20 milligrams of um, oxygen per liter per day into your ferment during active ferment. And a large body of work from the AWRI has demonstrated that the earliest and the highest exposure to oxygen has the most profound impact on the composition of the resulting wines and significantly lowers the risk for the formation of reductive aromas. And this is also demonstrated here in this case study that I'm going to show you now. So um, 
a year or two ago, we conducted um, a trial, a winery scale trial, so quite large, where we also sparged our, um, we tried to make the wines as stinky as possible. So we used the, we stinky yeast, our juice level of yan was low and we kept the wines as reductive as possible and we produced a lot of reductive characters. It was an awful Shiraz. We were very happy. And then we remediated this wine with commonly used remediation strategies. And one of these techniques were, was this um, macro oxygenation technique. And you can see how much air we're actually bubbling through using a center, a TP center at the bottom. And we also measured the amount of um, air or oxygen that we could introduce into the ferment. So you can see here in the beginning, um, before sparging, um, the dissolved oxygen concentration was zero, but then we could bring it up to about just under bit of four um, ppm, so half air saturation. And then as the um, ferment um, increased or the, um, elapsed, we um, could actually increase the um, amount of air put into the wine to about 80% saturation. And this uh, was a very, very effective remediation technique. When comparing it to the other techniques that we used, um, we used copper fining, we used adonalese, and we used a DAP addition in the beginning. We found that our macro oxygenation and also a combination of copper and macro oxygenation produced beautiful um, Chardonnay, oh, Shiraz wine, sorry, with red fruit aroma and red fruit um, flavor. Whereas our control wines and our DAP treated wines was bitter and had, um, was um, um, known for their drain aroma. And then the wines that were treated with copper and lees had a lot more boiled egg aroma and rubber aroma. So what we found um, from uh, the work that we've done here over the last few years is that macro oxygenation is really a great technique to produce wines with beautiful red fruit aroma and lower your reductive characters. So um, if you have to move over to use copper fining, it can be very effective to um, remediate H2S, methanthyl, ethanthyl, and your disulfides. So it's more of a high intervention technique and really the last resort that we would um, recommend. So copper sulfide can be used um, as um, either as a cupric citrate bound to bentonite or just as your copper sulfide itself. We always recommend um, that early copper addition is much better. Um, so post press racking most effective just because then you still have some lees and some solids available to bind the copper and to help with its removal because any residual copper left in your wine just increases your risk for that returning reoccurring reductive aromas. And when you do your bench trials, we also recommend to do the smallest, smallest, smallest um, test that you can. So 0 0.05 milligram per liter dosages, just so you don't overdose your um, copper and then end up with too much residual copper. So the mechanism is quite simple, or that's what we always thought. You have stinky um, compounds in your wine like H2S, you add your copper sulfide and you form an insoluble copper sulfide complex that precipitates out. So you do your bench trials, form the copper sulfide. But unfortunately, it's that um, filtration step that has been shown recently to not occur. So we always thought it settles out, you filter it out and you don't have a problem. But recent work from Andrew Clark from Wagga has shown that even when you filter with a 0.45 or a 0.2 filter, the amount of, of copper that remains in your wine is still about half. So you can't remove all the copper and it remains in your wine. So, and this goes with what we found over the last few years of work here at the AWRI is that H2S often reappears post bottling when the reductive conditions have been reestablished. So we've tested this in many, many studies over many years in various different wines with different copper concentrations added. And we continuously see that your control wine, it also sometimes develop a little bit of H2S. But as soon as you add copper, as the wine age, you always see an increase in H2S over time. So increased copper is increased um, long-term increase in H2S. So that brings us to a couple of questions of why can't we remove the copper sulfide through fining? And why does this H2S appear, reappear post bottling? 
So um, lately, or a lot of later research has now shown that um, we're actually forming these polysulfanes, like I've been talking about previously, and they might involve uh, cysteine and glutathione, which is much more abundant than our volatile sulfurs and our H2S. And the proposed mechanism looks quite complicated, but we'll just briefly touch on it. So when you have your thiols or your um, glutathione or your cysteine in the wine, and, or your H2S, and it reacts with copper, you form this um, copper sulfide complex that can rearrange, and then you um, um, spit out this disulfide. But what's important is that this reaction keeps on going and you form um, this aggregate of copper sulfide, um, which is nanoparticles, and they behaved as dissolved species. So they stay in the wine and they don't precipitate out. And this reaction can continue to occur. So as long as you've got copper and thiols and H2S in your wine, you can continue to cycle through this reaction to form a hydrodisulfide. And this hydrodisulfide can then again, in the same way, continue to cycle and react with other thiols. And that's when you produce your polysulfanes. So with this polysulfanes in mind, we thought it would be important to try and understand Firstly, how easily are they produced? Um, are they very stable in wine? And can they really act as latent sources to H2S and other volatile sulfur compounds? So we set up a trial and we um, just added cysteine, H2S, um, some of our metals, copper and iron, and in a very oxidative environment in um, a model wine system. And we found we produced them super easily. So the polysulfanes look like this up here at the top with your two cysteine groups here on the side, and then you have your H2S sulfurs um, inserted here in the middle. And here you can see we produced a quite a big range of polysulfanes, so trisulfane, tetra, penta, hexa, so that just refers to the amount of sulfurs here in the middle in the sulfur bridge. And we found that their stability was related to their chain length. So the longer these um, polysulfanes became, the less stable they were. And then we expose them to things that they would normally be exposed to in a winery situation. So we expose them to ascorbic acid as well as SO2. So normal um, reducing agents that can be used in the winery. And we found that these polysulfanes broke down super, super easily in the presence of SO2, as well as ascorbic acid, but SO2 was really effective at breaking down these polysulfanes. And then we saw that as these polys broke down, we saw a corresponding increase in hydrogen sulfide and quite dramatically so, as you can see there, up to 200 milligrams per liter. So these polysulfanes can act as latent sources to H2S and they can be produced in an oxidative environment when there's lots of copper available. So that's really something to keep in mind. So we also have some other um, alternatives that we can use to copper. Um, and these are tannin additives. So there's quite a lot of um, tannin product, products out there that's been marketed to decrease the reductive character or um, increase freshness in wines. So with this in mind, we also started a trial and we looked at um, how these tannin products um, act in a situation where we were um, pushing the wine also to go a little bit reductive. And the mechanisms for um, removing the stinky sulfurs could most likely be through the chelation of transition metals. So if you bind up the metals that are linked to catalyzing the formation of these sulfurs, then those reactions won't take place. But it's also possible to um, form those sulfur traps that I spoke about previously, the quinones that can bind the sulfur compounds. So we used a commercial tannin marketed for its ability to add freshness and we monitored the wines over nine months. So we took a Chardonnay and we treated it with a bit of copper and then we monitored it. And in the second wine, we also added the copper, but then added a tannin compound. Oh, sorry. And then you can see that where the, um, the tannin, um, the one without the tannin, the control wine produced a lot of H2S over the course of nine months. But it also took a while for it to establish, right? Because many times when you bottle it and you look at the wines initially, you don't see any problems and you think everything is going fine. But then later when the wine is sold or aged, you start to see these reductive characters returning. And here you can see that the one with the tannin um, product 
um, produce a lot less H2S. So it shows a lot of potential, but we need to do a little bit more work in understanding the underlying mechanisms. So just as a summary, if we look at all the different um, remediation strategies that we have available to us, um, and we've done the best that we could, we've picked a low um, H2S producing yeast and we've closely monitored our juice matrix and then the most common and most effective treatments that um, are available to us is using aerated techniques or copper fining, just because they are effective against a wide range of stinky sulfurs and they are quite effective. So this is that um, decision tree that I spoke about um, that was published by Creatment et al. And um, I just wanna say, if there's any of these uh, references that you're interested in, please just send an email to the AWRI library and they will kindly forward you any of these um, papers that you're interested in. So um, this decision tree shows um, the gray boxes that shows the bad scenarios where either you have a stinky wine or you've done some treatments and you still have a stinky wine, so it wasn't effective at all. And then you have the light gray boxes that shows where you might have initially remediated your wines, but you are now stuck with these latent sources. And these latent sources might initially make you think that you've remediated your wines, but it can re-release your stinky files later. And the white boxes is, are the ideal situations where you've done your treatment and you've removed the thiols and um, your wine is beautiful. So when we start with um, a wine with a lot of H2S and methane thiol and we decide we want to go um, along the aeration route, then you have to consider if you have a wine that's very high in other sulfur nucleophiles like sulfur dioxide or glutathione, for example, because if you do have a lot of um, glutathione or SO2, then those oxidation reaction products would preferentially bind with the um, oxidation reaction products with, oh, sorry, with the SO2 or the glutathione. And then you would lose the glutathione or the SO2 rather than your H2S or your methane thiol. Whereas if you have a wine that's low in SO2 or glutathione, then your oxidation reaction products would in fact bind with your H2S and methane thiol and then remove them through um, producing quinone thiol adducts. So if we look at the copper fining route, if you add your copper to your wine, you'll form copper sulfhydryl complexes, those um, nanoparticles that, does, that behaves like dissolved species. Um, but if you have a wine that is still a little bit unstable, so it has some sediment or some lees, then that sediment or lees will bind to the sulfhydryl complexes, um, get removed, and then you don't have a problem because they're not present in your wine anymore to act as latent sources. But if you don't have um, an unstable wine, then those complexes will remain um, in your wine. So our take home messages today is always prevention is better than cure. It's much better to try and set up your wine good from the start through good yeast selection, making sure that your yan um, levels are good and not, and also importantly, don't just do a standard DAP addition because um, a recent uh, survey that was done by Simon Nordeskard from the AWRI showed that the majority of winemakers or wineries um, do standard additions of DAP without um, testing the yam first. And because we know that um, over supplementation with DAP can also lead to H2S formation, that is something to keep in mind. And then of course, be careful for any elemental sulfur residues on the grapes. So we found that macrooxygenation lowers the risk of the formation of reductive characters. It's very effective in the long term. We've um, studied these wines for up to, I think, two years after the wines were bottled and presented them at um, AWITC workshops. And they still produced the um, beautiful, or they still had their beautiful red fruit character with lower reductive aromas compared to the controls and the copper treated wines. And copper addition and copper fining increases the risk of producing um, latent sources. And these latent sources um, release H2S or has the potential to release H2S post bottling. And then of course, it's very important to know your wine and understand at which point to intervene and when to remediate for whatever treatment would be the most effective to dec decrease the specific um, stinky sulfurs that you're trying to remove. <laughs>
So I would just like to thank a whole group of people because all this work has been done um, as a big team effort with lots of people involved in the sensory and the chemistry um, and as well with the winemaking from our WIC winemaking services. And also a big thank you to Wine Australia for their funding because without them, the work would not be possible. And also for um, the contributions of all the winemakers through um, your um, levy pays. So thank you so much. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Marlies. Uh, fantastic job of covering off some, or well, a significant amount of really great content there and providing some really clear take home messages. Um, Marlies is gonna stick around for a little while. So if you've got any questions regarding um, some of the issues that she's discussed here today, um, please start sending through your questions um, just a reminder, if you do want to ask a question, open the Q&A part of your webinar toolbar or click on that button. Type your question in and click to send it through. Uh, Marley's also mentioned the, um, the option to request any of the literature that she cited in her presentation. So feel free to contact the library directly at infoservices at awri.com.au. In addition to that, Marley's also compiled a number of key references or resources around this topic. Um, and you'll receive some information about how you can request those in the uh, follow-up notification. So Marley's, we don't have any, no, sorry. We have got a question that's just come through. Okay, so a question here from Adam, and Adam's asked, does ferment temperature affect the production of reductive aromas? So we know that um, the faster fermenters um, that will pr probably ferment quite hot does produce a lot more H2S than some of the other yeasts. Um, but I think it's also important that when you have a super fast fermenter that um, the H2S will be produced um, quite early during the fermentation um, cycle. And whatever's, it's, not, it's never the total amount of H2S that's being produced that's a problem, but rather at what point during fermentation um, the H2S is being produced, because when it's early on during a very fast ferment, there's still a lot of other gases being produced like um, CO2, and then um, the H2S gets entrailed and removed from the ferment with these gases that's also um, produced. But when you produce the H2S a little bit later during the second stage, then um, there's no gases to remove the H2S. Um, and then it can be incorporated into other um, larger molecular um, weight complexes. So I do think um, ferment temperature can affect the production of reductive aromas, but whether that's a long-term problem, I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you, Marlies. And thanks, Adam, for your question there. Another question here from Glenn. What level of yan is required before starting DAP? So um, I'm not a winemaker, so um, I'm a chemist by trade, So, um, but there's a lot of good information. Um, where the AWI did some research at looking at the different levels of DAP. So I think um, what they said was that there's actually quite a wide range um, of people of, of Yan that is um, fine to not uh, supplement with any DAP. So I think that's from, I think up to from in between 100 to 400 is average values for, for Yan in wines. But I would refer you to um, some of the pu published papers that specifically mentions the right amount of DAP to add. Okay, thank you. We've got another question here from Jeremy who's asked, do you think additions of, of gluto Glutathione to reds and whites pre-ferment are a bad idea. Um, yes, I think it's quite risky because um, from work that's been done uh, many years ago and also that we've done recently, it really looks like um, the small benefits that you can get from the amount of glutathione that people are recommending, because I think they recommend about 20 milligrams per litre of glutathione to add it to your ferments. And that is very, very small. Um, when you add such small amounts of glutathione, it doesn't really have any protective um, impact. It's too small to really act as an antioxidant and protect your wines from losing your beautiful tropical styles. 
Um, but then it's enough to form latent sources or be involved in um, the desulfurization and producing H2S. So I would say it's not worth the risk. Okay, thanks for your question there, Jeremy. Another question here from Vanessa, who's asked whether there are any updates on why reductive characters are common in wine in can packaging. Do you have anything to comment on that, Marlies? Yeah, so my thoughts on that is actually, um, I think it's maybe we're making things out to be more complicated than they really are because um, reductive environments in wines and in cans are exactly the same. So factors that will um, increase the formation or the risk of producing reductive aromas in wines are the same as the ones that will do it in cans. So one of the key things with the cans are metals, of course, because it's an aluminium can. And I think even in the 70s, there's been papers published that showed that aluminium leads to increases in H2S. Aluminium is also very soluble in an um, in a acidic environment. So I think many of these cans liners are not as good as they should be. So you can see a big uptake of aluminium. So increased aluminium, increased H2S for me, it's actually quite simple. So I would say fix the liners. Okay, thanks for your question, Vanessa. A question here from Frank. Um, with regards to application of macro ox, how should this be applied in particular for smaller open vats or barrel winemakers? So that, um, that uh, video that I showed you was um, done in a 50 litre um, tank or fermenting vessel. So that was quite small and we used uh, sinters. So the centers were um, placed in series. So we had four, and also the size of the center is very important because that's one thing with macro oxygenation. The size of your bubbles are very important. If your bubbles are too big, then you can't really get a good uptake of your air into your ferment. So you need tiny bubbles. Um, and they, um, they, there's lots of different ways that you can do it. So either with T pieces or um, um, a complete, uh, I don't know how to describe it, but like a cross at the bottom of the ferment um, that you can put the white of the air in. So that's just connected to um, an air um, cylinder with a regulator. And then just using the guidelines that we said that um, two to 20 milligrams uh, of oxygen per liter of wine per day. And we usually do this during active ferment. So as soon as we start seeing um, a 20% um, decrease in the original sugars, it's usually when we start applying our macro ox techniques. Um, and then um, we do that usually for three to four days during active ferment, just to be sure that, you, that the oxygen is employed when um, the ferment is the most active. But I can also, um, if you've got any questions about how to um, put air into your ferments in the best way, I can also um, recommend that you speak to Simon Schmidt from the AWRI because he's doing a lot of research in when is the best way to apply macro ox techniques, how long to apply it for, and just different type of um, methods to put it into your ferment. Okay, great. Thanks for your question there, Frank. Um, question here from Ken, who's noticed over a shift over time with white wine that initially shed strong dial character that became a non-pleasant metallic character after five years. Um, and then the question is, how stable are these initially worrying, worrying compounds? So I think probably with a dial, maybe that's a typo. I think maybe you mean a thiol or maybe disulfide potentially. So um, the characters can definitely change um, as the wine age and that metallic character could be related to uh, the metal complexes that was produced um, early on. Um, these, uh, the disulfides aren't really very stable. They depend on, on, on what type there's. The symmetrical tiny disulfides aren't very stable and they can easily revert back to release their thiols. But it seems like if they're bound to something a bit uh, larger, like glutathione or cysteine, that they appear to be a little bit more stable. I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Marlies. Um, question here about adding copper after macro ox uh, during ferment. Is that correct, Marlies? Can you just confirm that one? 
Yeah, so yeah, that's definitely correct. I did show that there. And that was more um, from a scientific interest point of view, because I think realistically, um, what we find, especially with white wines, I just want to, yeah, I see there's another question about what a red wine, oh, white wines and macro ox, but I'll touch on that a little bit later. So um, when you, um, we just added the copper to the macro ox to see if we can force the formation of these polysulfane sources, because like we said previously, if you have copper and you have macro ox and oxidative environment, then you can produce these latent sources. So I, I wouldn't recommend it. I think what we also found was that um, the wines that were treated with macro ox had nearly no reductive characters remaining after ferment. So when we did a bench trial test to see how much copper to add, we really only added a super tiny amount. So that was more for research interest sake than for, um, for a remediation side um, effects. And this work will be published quite soon. I'm in the final processes of writing up that paper. So it'll be published in the yellow journal within the next few months. So yeah, keep your eye out and then you can read all the finer details on that remediation trial. Okay, thanks Marley. Something to look out there for Michael and thanks for your question. Um, we've also got a question here from Fabiano who has asked about the tree you supplied and specifically are you suggesting we test for thiols are these and are these easily checked or do samples need to be sent specifically to AWRI? Um, I don't think you need to specifically send it to the AWRI because if you do your bench trial you can see whether you have thiols by um, whether they are um, remediated by adding copper or not. Um, if you want to know exactly the exact amounts of um, thiols in your wine and if there's any some, something weird that might not be responsive to copper or some of your other techniques, then of course, please send it to us. We're always super interested in all the weird and wacky things. Um, but the decision tree really makes you think more about um, if you've got a wine with a high SO2 concentration or lots of glutathione or other sulfur sources or whether your wine um, has got a lot of sediment um, present. So, and you can also um, really gauge a lot from the aroma descriptors of the thiols. Your thia acetates are usually more oniony and cheesy, and the thia acetates won't be responsive to um, aerative or copper fining treatments. And your disulfides also has, um, I think, more cheesy type of uh, characters. So H2S, methanthal, and ethanthal are usually quite um, known or specific in their aroma descriptors of rotten egg and um, putrefaction and sewage. So sometimes just using your nose and doing a simple um, copper test, uh, bench trial test will be enough. And um, you can also send your wines to us and we can do the copper cadmium test. So cadmium isn't a very nice compound to work with. So we can do it here at the AWRI with um, very well-trained scientists, if you'd like. Okay, another question here about macro ox and whether you can apply these rates to white wines as well. Yeah, so you definitely can and we have and um, on large winery scale uh, Chardonnay ferments and what we found was that you can, um, we didn't see um, large changes in um, our uh, aroma descriptors. So the wines went through sensory tests and you saw small changes um, in the aroma descriptors, but you have to be a little bit more careful with the white wines that you don't oxidize them. So again, um, there's, uh, I refer to you, or I'll ask you to speak to Simon Schmidt about some advice on exactly how to treat white wines with microox, because you have to be a little bit more careful. Okay, question here from Bryce. Bryce has written, Roger Bolton has suggested using redox potential as a critical measure for a range of reactions during and after fermentation, including production of sulfides. Marlies, what are your thoughts on this? And has any of your research looked at this as a complementary measure along with DO to use, to quantify use of oxygen in ferment? Yeah, so Roger Bolton has done amazing work with, work with his redox potential. Um, but I would like to refer to you to a paper that was recently published by one of my collaborators, um, John Danilowitz. 
where um, him um, and another researcher from um, the University of New South, uh, uh, New Zealand, sorry, they looked at, um, or they discussed and reviewed redox potential as a measure for, oh, and how to use it in wine. And their take homes were, so they're very good um, electrical chem electrochemists, and they found that, or their opinion was that redox potential in wine is maybe not, um, you're not really getting a, a specific redox potential in the wine, but it, that's, it's more a proxy for the amount of oxygen that's present in your wine. So as you increase your DO, you also see similar um, changes in your redox potential. So you definitely can use it, but whether it's different from just using a DO probe, um, I'm not so sure. So I'm leaning towards thinking that a simple DO probe would be more than good enough to measure um, your oxygen, dissolved oxygen. Thanks for your question there, Bryce. Uh, I've got a question here from Sierra. Does copper sulfate react with all the reductive compounds listed in the presentation or is it just some of these compounds? Yeah, unfortunately, no. So only with H2S, methanthyl and ethanthyl. Um, your disulfides can be reduced back by using ascorbic acid um, in the combination with SO2 to just help with, to prevent the reoxidation. So the disulfides can be reduced back to thiols and then you can remove um, the thiols from the wine. So with a little bit of jigging, you can remove the disulfides and you can remove your thiols very effectively. Um, we found that methanthal and ethanthal takes quite long to remove with copper and sometimes it's not as effective. So um, it's always, it's not ideal, but um, I mean, it's worth a shot if you haven't gone down the more aerative racking or macroox or oxidative handling techniques. Um, thiol acetates can't remove them. I don't think we've got anything at the moment that is very effective against them. DMDS usually is not a big problem because it can add a lot of complexity and it's rare that you see a wine with crazy amounts of DMS. And unfortunately, if you have too much DMS, there's not much you can do. Um, and then, um, yeah, so that's really it. And I, then your dialkyl sulfides can also not be removed with either copper or macroox easily. But we are busy um, working on some new and exciting um, remediation techniques at the AWRI. So it's also very fresh and new research, but it's showing a lot of promise. Thanks, Marlies. Uh, question here from Michelle. What effect can high levels of free SO2 have on reductive characters? Um, and as an example, she's given 90 ppm. Yeah, so um, it could be um, through a couple of pathways. We saw it also depends on the rest um, of your the matrix of your wine. So um, we've shown in a, a study a few years back that having high free SO2, if you have a lot of copper in your wine, can lead to the formation of, of a lot of H2S, a lot more than just the free SO2. So I think it's not just the SO2 by itself, but you need to have either precursors that are susceptible to the um, to be um, um, de uh, what, de uh, not decreased, um, broken down by SO2, like the polysulfanes reduced, sorry, that was the word I was looking for, or um, there's also talk about the possibility about SO2 being reduced to elemental sulfur and then the elemental sulfur producing H2S. But um, I still need to see a bit more um, research on that to be convinced that that's a potential pathway. So I think long story that it's not just the free SO2, but it's the, all the other compounds that's present in your wine too. If you have produced latent sources, then the SO2 could potentially reduce those latent sources or um, yeah, be involved in other manners. Okay, thanks Marlies. Couple more questions. So it looks like we're nearing the end. Um, question here from Casey. What are the recommended rates for ascorbic acid addition prior to copper sulfate? Oh goodness, again, um, when it comes to exact rates of these um, additions, like the DAP earlier or the ascorbic acid, I'll have to refer you to our AWRI help desk. They've got a lot of experience in giving people very clear recommendations of exactly how much of these um, additives to add and at what point. Um, unfortunately, I don't have that information, sorry. No problem. To contact the help desk, you can... Um... You can ring or you can contact them via email. Some details are available on our website, Casey, if you don't already know. 
Um, Possibly this one will be the final question, Marlies. Another one from Fabiano. Um, so with the unstable wines after adding copper uh, Cu2, when sediment settles, does this still react with sulfides slash copper in the wine or do you suggest mixing sediment back into the wine every so often? So um, in our trials, we didn't, we didn't mix the sediment. We just let um, the sediment lie there and that seemed to remove the copper quite efficiently. We've also recently published this work where we looked at whether um, the ability of lees to remove copper and other metals from a wine when the wine was treated very oxidatively compared to um, reductively. And we found by just leaving it on the sediment, um, it removed a lot of copper. So that is published in molecules and um, Michael can also send that paper on for you if you're interested in it. Um, so, um, but of course, I think mixing seems it would be better, but you also have a risk with lees that if you, um, so lees also has a lot of, um, can lies and release some of its own sulfur compounds. So they will be balancing that risk in introducing all the stinky sulfurs that's in the lees compared to the binding ability of the lees to remove the copper. Okay, thanks, Marlies. Might make this one the final question. Uh, so Susie's question is, what is the effect of membrane filtration on the removal of CU? So um, I'm not sure if, so the studies that have been done, um, I'm not sure that anybody specifically looked at membrane filtration, but I think it'll all come down to the pore size of the, filter, of the filter, independent of what the filter is made of. So you do get some filters that can actually um, absorb some of the copper and the copper sulfide as well. So that was also recently published by Andrew Clark. And they found that um, some of the um, filtration um, matrices bound the copper. But I think the most important thing is that the copper is so small, or the copper sulfide complexes are so small that they don't get removed and that they stay in the wine. So um, it's, it's the size of the copper sulfide complexes that is the problem. Um, so yeah, that's some of the things that we're working on at the moment is looking at different type of um, remediation techniques and hopefully we can then have something that can more readily um, remove the stinky sulfurs as well as potentially some of the metals. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Marlise, for um, answering some of those questions. A lot of interest and questions from the audience, which is also great to see. Um, We'll wrap up from here. So I'd like to first extend a big thank you to Marlies for uh, coming in and providing today's audience with some real uh, important key learnings around this topic. Um, and I'd also like to thank you, the audience, for uh, participating. Um, for all attendees, you will receive a follow-up email with a link to this recording. Uh, the next AWRI webinar, Marlies, would you mind shifting to the next slide there on your presentation? The next AWRI webinar is on Thursday, the 14th of November. Dr. Simon Nordisgaard from the AWRI will be providing some, some great insights into membrane contractors for dissolved gas management. So if you'd like to register for this session and you haven't done so already, please visit the AWRI website. Uh, thank you again. And I look forward to seeing you at the next AWRI webinar.